Winston Churchill famously described Russia as a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma, but uh, I think for many of us less well known is what he said next, because he commented about unlocking that riddle. He said, but perhaps there's a key, and that key is Russian national interest. The problem is that we're not dealing with the interests of the Russian people. We could be if we were broadcasting into Russia the way we did during the uh, Reagan administration when we had that message about political pluralism and tolerance and that message of educating people effectively in what was going on inside Russia and around the world, but we don't. So instead, <clears throat> we're dealing with the interests of Vladimir Putin because he's in a position there where he is calling the shots. And he has not demonstrated much interest in cooperating with the United States. In fact, many of his policies are directly undermining America, from selling advanced weapons to Iran, to destabilizing our allies by sending waves of Syrian refugees, over several million now, across their borders. And for the first time since the end of the Cold War, we have seen a situation where we've been forced to increase our military presence in Europe to make clear our readiness to defend NATO. Yet, in this environment, Putin continues to escalate, and that's why we've got this hearing today on our U.S. policy toward Putin's Russia. And over the past year, he has repeatedly sent Russian warplanes to buzz U.S. ships and planes in international waters. These are reckless acts, these are provocative acts, and a miscalculation could easily result in direct confrontation. As this committee has examined Russia's propaganda machine, and for any of you who've watched RT television, you can see how it has a constant stream of, of disinformation that it puts out about the United States, about the UK, about what actually happens in the world. But uh, that machinery under Putin is in overdrive. It is undermining governments, including NATO allies. And meanwhile, back in Russia, independent media and dissidents are forcefully sidelined. And uh, for the media, when I say forcibly, I mean uh, imprisoned or sometimes shot. A big part of the problem is that the administration has repeatedly rushed to try to cooperate with Russia, beginning with a string of one-sided concessions in the new START arms control agreement. I, I would just point out when we pulled out the interceptor system in Poland and in the Czech Republic, I think that was a blunder. We were quick to join diplomatic efforts in Syria, even as the opposition forces we support have come under repeated Russian aerial attack. And this has convinced the Russians that once again the administration will concede a great deal for very little in, concern, in, in return for the concession. And the, that does not mean that we should rule out cooperation with Russia. We should cooperate with Russia. But cooperation means benefits for both sides, a tougher and more consistent approach on our part might convince Putin that cooperation is more advantageous than the reflexive confrontation that he often resorts to. We have clearly demonstrated that we are open to cooperation. It is Putin who is not. And if he continues playing a zero-sum game and regards the U.S. as an enemy to achieving his ends, then the possibility of compromise is zero under that circumstance. Much of his behavior to date fits that description, most glaringly seen by his invasion of Ukraine and what happened in Georgia. Unfortunately, Putin has repeatedly calculated, rightfully so, that the administration's response to his aggression will be lackluster. The U.S., in cooperation with the EU and others, 
has imposed sanctions, which have resulted in significant pressure on the Russian economy, but the administration has refused to provide Ukraine, for example, with the anti-tank weaponry needed to stop Russian tanks, which can only be interpreted in Moscow as weakness. The tragedy is that there are many problems where both countries could benefit from cooperation. One of the most obvious is combating Islamist terrorism. One witness today has intensely studied its rapid spread in Russia and in Central Asia, which together provide the largest number of recruits for ISIS outside of the Arab countries. Putin says he is genuinely concerned about the rising threat. In fact, that was his stated goal in intervening in Syria, but as we know, his real agenda was to save the Assad regime, which has meant targeting the opposition forces that are supported by the, by the U.S. far more than any targeting of ISIS forces. It's clear that U.S. strategies to deal with Russia have failed. If we want to accomplish a different result, we must negotiate from a position of strength. Only then will cooperation be possible with a man who has demonstrated that the hope of cooperation cannot survive the cold calculation of his narrow interests. And one way to address this, to get back to a theme that I've, that I've pushed for a number of years here with my colleague Elliot Engel, is the legislation that Elliot and I have advanced to try to get back to a program as we once had with Radio Free Europe, which we should be doing with social media, with television, we should be broadcasting into Russia, telling Russians what is actually going on in their society, explaining to Russians what's happening around the world, explaining the issue of tolerance, of political pluralism, of these perceptions that the rest of the world have, and the truth. If Russia is going, if Putin is going to continue to put out disinformation, and misinformation and lie about the West. At the very least, we could be telling the truth about what's happening inside Russia to Russians so that the people had a better understanding of this situation. I now turn to Ranking Member Elliot Engel of New York for any, any comments he may have.